Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie Rowley. I'm with the NOAA Central Library, and I will be your host today. We have a very exciting and long-awaited seminar. Um, I'm glad you are all here. We did have to reschedule this from earlier in the month, but uh, I've been assured it is a much better presentation now. So thank you all for uh, joining us. Today is uh, Global Deep Sea Capacity Assessment Results. And I'm going to get through a few logistics first. So as an attendee, you are muted. So you can only chat or ask questions through the question panel. And if you have a question, we will be taking those, but we're going to take them at the end of the presentation. So there will be a good 10 to 15 minutes at the end to answer all of your questions. Feel free to put your questions in beforehand if you fear you're going to forget your question, but uh, we will have a dedicated time for Q&A at the end. Lastly, if you are experiencing any kind of technical difficulties, as in you can't hear the speakers or you can't see the slide deck, uh, please try logging off. That means Xing out in the top right corner of this uh, platform and try logging back in using that same link that usually solves most issues. Okay, and we are recording this today. So if you do have to uh, step away or if you would like to share this with a colleague after the fact, the library will be posting this up on our YouTube channel uh, at tomorrow at the latest. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joanne Flanders to introduce our speakers today. Thank you, Katie. We appreciate the webinar partnership we have with the library. As Katie said, I am Joanne Flanders and with NOAA Ocean Exploration, which is the only U.S. federal organization dedicated to exploring the deep ocean. Our mission is to explore for national benefit, and by doing that, we are filling gaps in the basic understanding of U.S. deep waters and the seafloor and delivering that ocean information needed to strengthen the economy, health, and security of the U.S. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers, Dr. Katie Croft Bell. She is the founder and president of Ocean Discovery League and a National Geographic Explorer. She's on a mission to break down the barriers to the deep sea by combining low-cost technologies, AI-driven data analysis, and capacity building to make access to the deep sea more efficient and accessible to all, especially those historically excluded in the field. Her background in ocean engineering, maritime archaeology, and geological oceanography, and leadership of dozens of expeditions around the world uniquely position her to create efficient, equitable systems to broaden access to the deep sea. Previously, she was founding director of the Open Ocean Initiative at the MIT Media Lab. And as executive vice president of Ocean Exploration Trust, she led the development of exploration, research, and educational outreach activities for the exploration vessel Nautilus, including management of scientists, engineers, educators, and students from more than 30 countries working together to conduct telepresence-enabled expeditions around the world. Our next speaker is Dr. Maud Quinzen. She is an ocean lover, feeling better at sea than on land, and her work centers on sustainability and proactively addresses the biological biodiversity crisis while she explores approaches that support social and environmental justice. An evolutionary and conservation biologist trained in Western science, she is learning about traditional knowledge and practices with local and indigenous knowledge holders to collaboratively propose holistic remediation against environmental conflicts and threats. She's notably looking at how technologies developed for the exploration and protection of the living world can influence our societies and how societies influence those technologies. For that, her work with indigenous communities to combine traditional knowledge with scientific developments aims at fully understanding local ecosystems and guiding the development of transformative technologies that encourage systemic changes essential for human and non-human lives to thrive. And now it is my pleasure to turn the program over to our two speakers. We'll begin with Dr. Bell. Thank you so much, Joanne. I'm going to share my screen and thank you all so much for joining us today. We're very excited to share some preliminary results, not preliminary, we're actually toward the, um, toward the final results end um, from one of Ocean Discovery League's first major projects, the 22 Global Deep Sea Capacity Assessment. This is a baseline assessment of the technical and human capacity for deep sea exploration and research in every coastal area with deep ocean around the world. That is area deeper than 200 meters. Now, 
We've only been working on this assessment for the last 18 months, but the idea has been growing for more than four years. It arose out of My Deep Sea, My Backyard, a pilot project that was sparked at an event that I hosted at the MIT Media Lab in 2018 called Here Be Dragons. My Deep Sea took place in Trinidad and Tobago and Kiribati and was led by Diva, um, excuse me, by Diva Amon and Randy Rogen. These two countries, Trinidad and Tobago and Kiribati, are small island developing states or SIDS that don't have the capacity to explore and research their own exclusive economic zones or EEZs. Now in 2018, we carried out this pilot project to provide deep ocean technology and training to people in Kiribati and Trinidad and Tobago. We learned a lot from this project and you can find our lessons learned and recommendations in a paper that was just published a month ago and hopefully Katie will be able to put the link to that paper in the chat. But most importantly for me, My Deep Sea highlighted the need for both increased access to deep sea technology and increased training to use that technology in countries that currently don't have the ability to explore their own deep EEZs. Um, and in case you didn't know of all of the EEZs in the world, 75% of them are deeper than 200 meters and half of them are between 2000 and 6000 meters. So they're quite deep. And lack of access to tools and training, of course, make it challenging, if not impossible, to explore, understand, and effectively manage one zone's waters, not to mention areas beyond national jurisdiction. Now, at the same time that we were running My Deep Sea, the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development was in its planning process. There has been a lot of attention focused on capacity building and the transfer of marine technology. However, a baseline assessment of deep sea technical and human capacity didn't exist. So there was no way to measure progress over the course of the decade. The Global Ocean Science Report from 2020, which is probably the closest analog, um, but it only includes the 45 countries responsible for 82% of ocean science publications from 2018, 2010 to 2018. So we believe that a much broader survey that includes all coastal areas with deep ocean is necessary, particularly those who are not able to publish as much as those with the resources to do so. Only a minuscule fraction of the deep sea, both within and beyond areas of national jurisdiction, has been scientifically explored and characterized due to a number of constraints, including expense, inefficiency, and inequitable access to the existing tools and resources around the world. But we're wondering what exactly are the gaps that currently exist? Are they technical? Are they human? Are the gaps dependent on ge geographical differences or economic differences? Um, or both, what exactly are the challenges and what are the greatest opportunities over the coming decade? So over the last year and a half, we've been working on the global deep sea capacity assessment to start to address these questions and to establish a baseline of where the current capabilities, gaps and opportunities lie around the world. So before we really dig in, I want to sincerely thank all the people who have made this project possible. It's a small but mighty team. Um, representing 10 countries around the world and is an amazing group of people and this project definitely could not have been accomplished without them. So to give you an idea of the next uh, 45 minutes or so, we'll hear from Maud Quinzen who will walk us through our data collection and analysis project process, um, followed by an overview of our assessment results. We'll then discuss some of our regional results and perspectives and finally let you know how to stay in touch and inform for updates. So I will now turn it over to Maud. Thank you, Gary. Um, and bonjour, everyone. So yeah, let me introduce you to our data collection. Um, we collected information about country capacities to explore the deep sea using two methodologies. First, we used a survey. And second, we used ourselves um, in online research um, that we did ourselves. So um, we, with the survey, we aimed to understand the current deep sea capacity and need for each region um, described by those who live um, and work there. So we aim to have the survey filled by anyone from any marine sector who wanted to take it for their country of origin or of residence or of work or any combi combination of that, but those who really know um, the country in question. 
And so the survey included 42 questions, some quantitative and some qualitative on human expertise and technical resources for deep sea exploration, such that we would learn about um, the institutions, the industries, and the access to technologies like vessels, submersibles, sensors, and data analysis tools in the country, but also about the personal opinion and knowledge that each respondent has regarding those capacities. We tried to make um, that survey uh, accessible to as many as we could by having the survey in four different languages, including English, French, Portuguese and Spanish, and by sharing it all on social platforms like um, social networks, listservs, blogs and newsletters. But this way of sharing limited the geographic reach and um, was depending on a lot on our own network. Um, so the extent of the ge geographic reach um, was not um, full and we wanted to in, um, expand that. So we started to systematically go online and search for marine professionals from all sectors um, like government, research, industry, conservation in the marine um, um, sectors. And um, we sent pers personal emails that were presenting the survey and inviting people to um, fill in the survey as well with the insurance that, they, that the result from that survey would be shared um, freely online. Um, at the end. Um, and this was really important and really greatly increased the number of participating countries to the survey. Um, also, yeah, that survey was um, endorsed by um, as an ocean decade activity. Now, um, that research so because we didn't have um, we didn't um, receive responses for all the coastal uh, countries with deep sea or sometimes we didn't have enough responses with a survey we came we came up with a second methodology and that was the the online research that we did for the same kind of information um, as we asked with the survey so we recorded national institutions like universities, governmental agencies, NGOs working on deep sea, or at least um, here on the marine environment uh, questions. And we also search for the presence, absence of different types of industries, again, vessels, sensors, submersibles, and data analysis um, capacities. Here again, uh, we try to understand the current deep sea capacity and needs for each region with someone working in that region. So we had eight marine researchers, um, one or two person per region, who used online tools, websites, open access reports, scientific publications, um, or their own personal network to do their research on deep sea exploration capacities in a specific region. We all used the same protocol for the research and all devoted about four hours to each geo area or country or territories that we that we treated using mostly English, but also sometimes local languages when possible and helpful. Now, um, the data um, coverage or how it, um, it's um, what was the outcome is that we, um, thanks to that assessment, we have information on the technical and human capacity of 186 geo areas. From these 186, um, uh, we have 119 geo, geo areas where we have both survey and uh, online research information data. And um, we have 62 geo areas for which we have only the research um, information, and we have five geo areas for which we have only the survey information. But all that um, collected um, research data um, 
um, yeah, so we have 186 geo areas. There are other, the other 73 geo areas, we didn't did the research, or we didn't include them in the study and the report because they don't have any ocean or um, their um, EEZ doesn't have enough, um, like a um, significant part of deep sea, it's less than a person, one person, um, or they are um, uninhabited or not permanently permanently inhabited. But we did research capacities, capacities from foreign countries and their overseas ter territories separately. So these were two different geo. If you had a, a sovereign country and a territory, there were two different geo, geo areas. Um, we are also now collaborating with the Environmental Systems Research Institute, or ESRI, and the GIS Corps to create country profiles giving information about depth and distribution of deep sea and data dashboards for each geo area that will also be made um, freely available to everyone online. And we will spread the news as much as we can when these come out, but um, Katie we will uh, we'll talk about that at the end of the presentation. Katie, back to you. Thank you, Maud. And now I'd like to share with you some of our results. Um, we don't have time for everything, but keep in mind that the full report and open access data are forthcoming very soon. So over the course of 11 months, we received 360 survey responses from 124 geographical areas or geo areas around the world. Mode mentioned this term um, previously. We use the term geo area to include both sovereign countries and dependent territories. Um, we received the most responses, 34 from the United States, 10 or 11 each from Venezuela, Israel, and South Korea. Um, only one for each of 50 geo areas and somewhere in between for all the rest. Um, and 90% of respondents lived in the geo area they were representing, so the vast majority were uh, local perspectives. Respondents were also represented a range of demographics and professional roles. About two thirds were men, nearly three quarters had advanced degrees, and also about three quarters worked in academia or government. Now of the 360 responses, 224 or about 62% were for low middle income uh, and economically unclassified geo areas. And 73 responses were for 33 small island developing states representing more than half of all SIDS around the world. And for categorizing geo areas by economy, we use the definitions established by the World Bank. So at this point, we have analyzed all the data at global and regional levels. At the global level, we compared six regions, Europe, Asia, Northern America, Africa, Oceania, and Latin America and the Caribbean, which you can see here. And for each regional analysis, we compared subregions. So there are four or five subregions per region for a total of 21 around the world. Uh, for example, in Asia, which you can see here is purple. We have Western Asia, that's the darkest purple, Southern Eastern and Southeastern Asia. We did not include Central Asia in the assessment, which is the latest, um, because it has no ocean, although interestingly enough, a couple of the countries there claim EEZs within the Caspian Sea. I learned a lot of geography in the process of this study. So moving on to the, so the survey itself, uh, the first set of survey questions were focused on respondents' opinions on the status of deep sea exploration and research in their geo area or in their country or territory. So they were asked to what extent they agreed with three different statements on a five point scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. The first was deep sea exploration and research are considered important in my geo area. Now, while we asked them to respond to, for their geo area, these maps that you're going to see show the average results for each subregion because in many cases, we've already noted that we only received one response for a given um, location, and we didn't think that that was quite enough information to assess the status of an entire country or an entire territory. 
So blue, uh, the darker blues show more agreement while the lighter blues show less agreement that deep sea exploration and research is considered important in the respondents geo area. Globally, more than half of the respondents agreed or strongly agreed that this statement is true, but you can see that there are differences at the sub-regional level. The second statement was, we have in-country tools and technology to conduct deep sea exploration and research. Again, more agreement is shown in darker blues on the same scale as the first map. You may notice that this map is a lot lighter than the previous one. That's because less than half of the respondents agreed or strongly agreed that they had in-country tools for deep sea work. And the final statement was, we have in-country expertise to conduct deep sea exploration and research. And again, we use the same color scale. In this case, more than half or agreed or strongly agreed that they have in-country deep sea expertise. But you may notice that this map is a bit darker than the tool map. Yet again, there are some regional differences. And I do think it's interesting to note that in every subregion, the expertise rating is equal to or higher than the tool rating. So we're seeing that people um, are more qualified than the tools that they have um, in, their, in their country or territory. So I know that these three maps have, have a lot going on. So I'll just walk you through one little example here. Uh, we can take a look at the left at Western Africa. Um, from which we received 21 surveys. Their respondents mostly agreed that deep sea exploration and research is important in their geo area. The importance rating was four, but they had one of the lowest self-assessments of having in-country deep sea tools. So their tool status rating is one, and they had a sort of mid-range assessment of in-country deep sea expertise, and that was three. So because these ratings vary from subregion to subregion, we tried to take a look and see if there were any similarities between them. And there were. So let's take a look at that. We plotted each subregion's tool rating on the x-axis versus expertise rating on the y-axis and found six groups. So that's A through F here. In the upper right corner, we have subregions where respondents had strong agreement that they had both tools and expertise in their geo area. And in the bottom left corner, we have subregions where respondents had low agreement that they had both tools and expertise in their geo area. Now where it starts to get interesting is when we bring in the importance rating. The darker and larger groups are those that most strongly agreed that deep sea exploration and research is considered important in their geo area, while the smaller and lighter groups are those that agreed with that statement the least. So in the upper right, um, group A here, we find Eastern Asia, Western Europe, and Northern Europe with high tools, high expertise, and high importance ratings. Um, but you may be surprised not to see Northern America there. That's because it's in group B here with Australia and New Zealand, both of which have high tools and expertise, but low respondent agreement of importance of deep sea exploration and research. In the opposite corner, we find in group F, um, this had low ratings across the board, tools, expertise, and importance. Um, and if you're wondering what happened to Western Africa, that fell in group D here with low tool rating, mid expertise, but they considered deep sea exploration and research um, of high importance in their country. So using these groups, these um, status assessment groups, we can attempt to evaluate the perceptions of the survey respondents and of deep sea exploration and research importance and resources at the sub-regional level based on their own assessments um, for their own countries and territories across the globe. And now we're gonna look um, in a lot more detail. Um, so next we looked at organizational infrastructure using both the research and the survey. So first we considered the presence of different types of organizations. We surveyed respondents and conducted research to identify deep sea and marine organizations, including universities and research labs, government agencies and ministries and other organizations. Each research and survey data source had a limit of five organizations per type per geo area. So the yellow line on the graph shows the number of data sources per region that we had 
and the bars show the total number of organizations that we identified in each region by type. Higher data sources could mean that there are more geo areas in that region or that we received a, a lot of surveys from that region. So in total, we identified more than 2,000 deep sea and marine organizations globally. About 800 were government agencies, and those are in blue. About 800 were academic in orange, and about 500 were other organizations. Could be NGOs um, or other kinds of organizations that deal with these kinds of issues. We also calculated um, the number of organizations identified per data source, per geo area, in an attempt to kind of normalize it because um, well, North America obviously is quite low, Africa is quite live, high, there are a lot more countries in Africa than there are in Northern America. So um, in the end, if you normalize it by geo area, Northern America and Europe had the highest number of deep sea and marine organizations uh, per geo area, while Latin America and the Caribbean had the lowest. Now we also researched whether or not 10 different marine industries were present in each geo area and independently asked survey respondents which industries were present. So we did this in the research and um, in the survey. And I'm not gonna run you through the down and dirty details on these graphs. So I'll just give you some of the um, highlights. The most present industries globally were marine transportation, fisheries and aquaculture and tourism. Deep sea mining was the least present. Uh, research and survey results generally agreed with each other. Um, but the one big difference was that survey respondents greatly overestimated the presence of deep sea mining as an active industry within their geo area. Um, we don't know why exactly, but it could be because it is such an important and contentious issue right now that is on a lot of people's minds. So that was one of the biggest differences in results between the, um, the research and survey for the presence of marine industries. Now, moving on, a major portion of the survey and the research was focused on the technical capacity, um, both, both the technical capacity, sorry, um, present in each geo area and available to survey respondents. So is it there and do survey respondents have access to it? So for this portion of the work, we focused on four types of technical capacity that uh, Mode um, alluded to earlier, vessels, deep submergence vehicles, or DSVs, sensor systems, and data tools. So we don't have time to go through each one, um, so I'm gonna walk you through the process for some of the DSV data. So the first question um, was focused on presence. Um, what types of DSVs exist in a geo area? So to answer, we did research on each one to determine whether or not any of a list of DSV types was present there. And this was a binary rating, one for yes, zero for no. So if there was an ROV in Mexico, it got a one. If there was none, it got a zero. Um, so this graph shows the percent of geo areas in each region um, in which our research team found each type of deep submergence vehicle. So you can see that we found more, the higher bars in Europe, Asia, and Northern America, um, and lower bars in Africa, Oceania, and Latin America, and the Caribbean. I don't think any um, surprises here. We did um, try to include as many different types of DSCs as possible. Um, and the second question was, to what types of vehicles do people have access? So this question was answered through the survey. Uh, respondents were asked to select all the types of vehicles to which they had access. And so this graph on the right shows the percent of respondents in each region that said they had access to each type of vehicle. Perhaps unsurprisingly, again, we see higher access in Europe, Asia, and Northern America, and lower access in Africa, Oceania, and Latin America, and the Caribbean. And gray, you can see those high bars over on the right, those are none of the above. So some of our global level research findings are that the most present DSVs found were remotely operated vehicles, <clears throat> autonomous underwater vehicles and benthic landers. Eastern Asia had the highest DSV presence um, at the sub-regional level and Western Africa had the lowest. And for some of our survey findings, the most accessible DSVs were ROVs, AUVs and landers, same as the research. 
Um, 44% of respondents didn't have access to any DSVs. Uh, Northern America and Northern and Western Europe had the highest access, while Melanesia and Micronesia, excuse me, um, had the lowest access to vehicles. So these are, again, the highest level global findings. We also include in the, in the final report the sub-regional breakdowns for um, each of the regions, which will show you a lot more nuance than, um, than we have here. So respondents were also asked how deep the vehicles to which they had access could operate. Um, 203 respondents reported on the depth capabilities of 570 vehicles, only two thirds of which could actually operate in waters deeper than 200 meters. Vehicles of all depth ratings exist in all regions of the world, but again, there's variation between them. In Africa, Asia, Oceania, and Latin America, and the Caribbean, only about half of the respondent reported vehicles could operate at depths deeper than 200 meters. In contrast, 80% of the vehicles reported for Europe and 96% of the vehicles reported for Northern America could operate deeper than 200 meters. And in fact, more than three quarters of the DSVs reported for Northern America could operate deeper than 2,000 meters. The last set of questions I'll share about DSVs is related to the survey respondent satisfaction with the tools to which they have access. They were asked how satisfied they were with vehicles in their geo area in terms of cost, availability, capabilities, depth rating, and duration. And this was on a five point scale from very satisfied to very dissatisfied. On average, respondents globally were generally dissatisfied with available deep submergence vehicles. In Northern America and Europe, respondents were the most satisfied. In Asia and Africa, they were more neutral to dissatisfied. And in Oceania and Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, respondents were the least satisfied. And with regard to the specific aspects of DSV operations that we asked about, generally respondents were dissatisfied with cost and availability. They're too expensive and we can't get them. And they were more split in opinion on capabilities, depth rating, and duration. So this is a lot of information and um, we researched organizational infrastructure and technical capacity to identify presence of these things in each geo area and use the survey responses um, to identify access to them and satisfaction of those resources for each subregion. And similar to those status groups, we attempted to um, put them all together to try and see if there are any um, global trends. So we used all this information to create three indices, each on a scale of one to five, one for low, five for high. The presence, deep sea capacity presence index includes the presence of organizations, marine industries, vessels, deep submergence vehicles, sensor systems, and data tools based on the research for each geo area. The accessibility index uses survey respondent um, access to different types of vessels, DSVs, sensor systems, and data tools in each subregion. And the satisfaction index uses respondent satisfaction of vessels, vehicles, sensors, and data tools, again, in each subregion. So to walk you through one quick example, we can look at Southern Asia. It has a mid to high presence index. You can see the darker colors um, on the left, a mid accessibility index of three and a very low satisfaction index. Now using these indices, we can identify four groups of subregions based on similarities between them with regard to um, presence of deep sea infrastructure on the X axis, access to the deep sea technologies on the y-axis and level of satisfaction with the technologies available, um, which are indicated by color with darker subregions being more satisfied. So in the top right, we have two subregions with high presence of access to and satisfaction with deep sea infrastructure and tools. Next is a group of six subregions with mid to high presence, access, and satisfaction. Third is a group of five subregions with mid to high presence and low to mid access and satisfaction. And finally, the largest group is eight subregions 
with um, low ratings of presence, access, and satisfaction with deep sea infrastructure and tools. And in case you're wondering, Southern Asia falls right here in the third group. So in contrast to the, um, the status assessment groups, um, which are focused on overall respondent perception of their geo area, these deep sea capacity indices represent, excuse me, um, they represent extensive research on the presence of vessels, vehicles, sensors, and data tools, survey respondents reported access, and their satisfaction. So they're an initial attempt to assess the relative ability for researchers to conduct deep sea exploration and research from organizational infrastructure through to data collection and all the way to analysis. It's not just do we have a vehicle or not, it's all of the things that we think um, are critical to be able to undertake this kind of work. So the final section of the survey um, was focused on participants' opinions on the most pressing challenges facing them um, with regard to deep sea exploration and research and the opportunities about which they're most excited in the next five to 10 years. So the top challenges across the globe, or the top challenge across the globe without question was funding. Um, and we can break down the second and third top challenges by region. Um, across the global north, we see that access to vessels um, was the next biggest challenge, followed by access to deep submergence vehicles in Europe and North America, and human capacity in Asia. And across the global south, the second highest challenge is human capacity, followed by vessel access in Africa, and Latin America and the Caribbean, and access to deep submergence vehicles in Oceania. And we saw a similar trend when it comes to opportunities that participants are excited about in the next five to 10 years. Training opportunities were the top choice in the global south with more precise data collection, a close second in Oceania. And in the global north, we found that less expensive data collection was the top opportunity with training opportunities, a close second in Asia. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Mode to discuss some of the regional perspectives from our research team. Thank you, Katie. Um, here we go. So here I'm going to present you the perspective that we've prepared for each region with the researchers who did the online research um, and which reflects what they've learned by doing the research, their challenges doing the research, and their lived experience in their region. So, Oceania. All right. Um, so, Oceania claims um, the largest EEZ and deep sea area of all regions and the largest depth zone in Oceania by area lies between 4,000 and 6,000 meters below sea level, covering 50% of all Oceanian EEZs. Now, our research found that Oceania has a diverse marine industry from tourism opportunities to cargo boats, services, offshore surveillance, and of course, fisheries. Um, while uh, low-income nations were found to have limited technology and technical expertise for deep sea exploration, they are also more suited towards using traditional uh, practices and knowledge. Also, um, uh, geo areas like uh, new, maybe I'm not pronouncing that right. <laughs> new, new way. New way. <laughs> Um, Tokelo and Christmas Island um, are still territories of either Australia or New Zealand, which are still providing capacity support to those smaller islands. And in fact, um, foreign capacity is very present in Oceania in general, notably for in industries like construction uh, or renewable energy, or even across industry, um, for uh, example, for a country like the Marshall Islands. Now, um, offshore industries have been developing a lot in Oceania and have created um, economic opportunities across all nations. 
and this increases social capacity through marine related jobs and citizens pursuing higher education. But one area that apparently lacks capacity in skills, data and resources is deep sea exploration and mining. The deep sea is very difficult to access, requiring expensive technology and um, to, to study. So uh, those technologies, um, not many of the nations that are in uh, Oceania don't have them. And so um, the lack of technology is luckily responsible for the lack of information on this ecosystem. And in the recent years, minerals such as manganese nodules found at uh, 4,000 to 6,000 meters deep have become a global interest and value. And because of these new interests, there is now an invested drive to understanding how these resources can be extracted and extracted with uh, minimal impact, as well as understanding the function of the environment these nodules are formed in. And so a lot of research and data is now required to provide new information on these nodules rich areas within the Pacific. So um, finding findings from the Global Deep Sea Capacity Assessment Report will highlight those nations or institutes worldwide that have the capacity to work in the deep sea. It can, it can help the nations, um, I mean, it can guide the nations that hold these minerals to find independent researchers to help collect baseline data needed to make informed management decisions regarding the exploration and exploitation of those deep sea ecosystems. And the report can also uh, provide details on where mineral rich nations can invest um, in scholarship opportunities to send citizens to universities that can teach deep sea ecology, engineering and policy making to really build that local capacity. And having used um, deep sea mining as an example for Oceania, Oceania, Oceania um, we can see that the Global Capacity Assessment Report provides a unique source um, of um, information where governments, researchers and NGOs from Oceania can now know where current deep sea capacity resources are. And that access to this consolidated information with transparent data can now be used to make uh, informed management decisions. All right, we go to Africa. All right, so Africa uh, presents a unique opportunity for expansion of low cost accessible deep sea research and exploration. The largest deep zone, um, depth zone by area in Africa lies uh, between 2000 and 4000 meters below sea level, covering 46% of all African EEZ, um, followed by 4,000 to 6,000, covering 31% of all EECs in the region. So exploration tools with the capacity to reach 6,000 meters would unlock access to the vast majority of the African EECs. Um, deep sea exploration is definitely a new era of marine science in the region and the assessment of deep sea capacity in Africa is already a crucial step in the development of deep sea capacity by helping to promote equitable opportunities for African countries to explore and manage their own deep sea ecosystems. The research we conducted has led to the, class the classification of African countries into three categories depending on their capacity. The first category includes the re relatively developed countries like Morocco, Algeria, Egypt or um, South Africa. Those countries have already conducted research on deep sea ecosystems. For example, Egypt has studied um, deep sea ichthyofauna from the eastern Mediterranean Sea. Tunisia carried out studies up to 800 meters deep with the collection of sediments, phytoplankton, and water samples, and has even organized short term expedition using ROVs. And South Africa is one of the most developed in terms of deep sea research and capacity, but it still lacks 
the proper funding uh, and in-country skills and therefore often relies on foreign funding and capacity to achieve its goals. Now, the second category of countries um, classified by their capacities is um, the, Afri um, are the African territories that are still under the leadership of European countries. So they can be benefiting from their developed research infrastructures, but they are lacking their own structure. Most of these are islands distributed between the Atlantic and the ocean uh, and the Indian Ocean, like uh, the British Indian Ocean Territory or uh, Mayotte. Now, the last category that we have includes African countries that suffer from a huge lack of deep sea capacity due to the higher rate of poverty and weaknesses in that ter in terms of um, marine sciences. Deep sea ecosystems of geo, geo areas such as Cabo Verde remain largely and explored. Um, also Mauritania, a geo area known to host important marine biodiversity due to the phenomenon we know as upwelling, does not have um, a developed scientific infrastructure that could allow the study of its own deep sea ecosystem. So there's clearly a lack of capacities in, in those uh, places. And most of the work done to date on deep sea in the 44 countries assessed in uh, Africa through the aid of the foreign research vessels and human uh, capacity. And in-country skills need to be prioritized, funded, and if African countries need to get involved in the deep sea research in an interdisciplinary and collaborative manner. Let's go to Latin America and Caribbean. All right, so while the Americas claim the second smallest EEZ area of all regions and the second smallest overall deep sea area, not including the overseas territories claim, claimed by um, geo areas in the Americas, 97% of the individual geo areas in the Americas have the ocean within their EEZs. So that's a lot. They all have it, almost. Um, of course, the United States of America, Chile, Canada, Brazil, and Mexico have the largest deep ocean areas within their own EECs. But the opportunity for, ad um, for additional individual countries uh, in the Americas and the Caribbean to participate to the uh, deep to deep ocean exploration is definitely significant as well. So they're all very important in this. Um, the Latin America and Caribbean region has a well-developed human capacity. So the region has a high potential for leading innovation in deep sea research. And this could be enhanced by developing the research infrastructure. So they have the, the people, but they need the tools. Now, the highest uh, capacity was associated with higher income countries in uh, South America and Mexico. And of course, the least developed nations in Central America present scarce research infrastructure, even if in some cases, advanced human capacity has forged um, trusted partnership with foreign organization and resources. In general, the countries with the most capacity for deep sea exploration and research are the ones that have exploited oil and or gas from the ocean and the deep sea, such as um, Brazil and Mexico. In the case of Chile and Peru, research capacity has been developed around fisheries management and also um, sovereignty um, studies in Antarctica. And other countries um, from the region have partnered with um, wealthy US, Japan, Russia, and Germany to conduct observations of the seafloor, but they don't have uh, vehicles present in their own um, region or in their own country. Also, Colombia, Ecuador, Uruguay, and Chile have developed deep submergence vehicles prototypes, which are at the preliminary um, stages to enter the commercial phase 
and Chile is even uh, a good example in leading innovation in the region with its lender um, uh, named Audacia. So there are examples of advanced human capacity in the region. Now the Central America uh, subregion is the least explored and thus offers the most opportunities for international collaborations and national research, particularly the Middle America Trench, which remains almost unknown and represents an ideal region for deep sea discovery. The South America and Caribbean region and, um, are more explored and well docu documented in terms of geo geo geological features and habitat mapping, but still with very much to do in terms of biological connectivity and circulation dynamics. Now, the, this capacity assessment um, represents a solid baseline documentation that will help identify potential gaps and opportunities for the research and funding allocation, as well as the identification of potential markets uh, that could boost the blue economy in low and middle income countries in the region. Going to Asia. Um, the continent of Asia has a rich and um, centuries old history of exploration, um, but it also covers an incredibly vast uh, landscape filled with economic and cultural diversity, stretching from Cyprus, um, going to Japan. And so um, Asia has the second largest EEZ and the third largest deep sea area of all the region assessed. And given, uh, given its size and the geographic and economic diversity it encompasses, um, it is no surprise to us that the research results throughout Asia varied greatly. Now, the research conducted has provided us with many insights uh, regarding all the capacities. However, um, over the challenges that we had during the research is the lack of access to information of certain countries. Some of them just don't give uh, access to their information. Um, and so this really limited the in amount of information that we could get for some of the geo areas we were searching. Also, certain geo areas, such as Palestine, do have deep sea environments, but they, um, because of tensions with other countries, they are not able to access these areas of deep sea or of ocean, and are also heavily limited in the amount of research that they can that they can do. So um, that's limiting their um, capacities um, and their yeah their possibility to explore the ocean. Now, other in-country limitations we found include the lack of technology to conduct deep sea research, risks of conducting research, uh, for example, due to military activity, or even restrictions imposed by the local government itself to do research. So they can't because the government doesn't want to. And so um, we have also noticed that all, only a small number overall with this capacity assessment, um, we we noticed that the um, the number of universities, government agencies, and organizations have the capacity to get to conduct deep sea research is very low. It's only um, a very small fraction. Although some fra some countries do have access to deep sea technology, like ROVs, AUVs. Um, their main focus most of the time is um, for oil explo exploitation or for military purposes and not necessarily to um, get to know the ocean or even for conservation efforts. So the, much, the motivation is mainly for the growth of the economy through deep sea mining, for example, um, certainly at the moment, and not for the conservation of um, these unknown environments. Finally, uh, we have a diverse number, we had a, 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 a diverse number of languages, um, definitely for Asia, and so at times it would prove very challenging um, to gather information regarding um, 
deep sea exploration. So the translation tools have been very important um, to find certain pieces of, of information, but this was still a challenge for the research, definitely for that region. Uh, overall, several countries such as South Korea, Japan, and China have already conducted deep sea research through, the na through national efforts. Other countries also have conducted this type of research through collaboration with foreign experts, um, but most of them, yeah, the, most of them are depending on, are still depending on uh, foreign capacities. Now we go to Europe. All right, Europe. It's the smallest EEZ and deep um, and deep EEZ of all the region. Um, of course, not including the EEZ claims of overseas territories and dependencies in other um, geographic regions. So, for example, French Polynesia is in the um, Pacific, is not for France, and so it's not in Europe. And um, while countries like the Netherlands, Germany, or even Belgium um, have significant capacity to explore, explore the deep sea, they were not included in the research because their own EEZ don't have any or enough deep sea waters. And again, it's like we had the threshold of 1% of deep sea in the, in the EEZ. Now, uh, we have evidence, of course, um, from these capacity assessment that indicates with no surprise that many exploration and research is happening from um, the European countries, and they already have taken part in deep sea research using technologies like AUVs, uh, but way more than that, and ships and everything. But there appears to be a gradient from the west to the east in the focus and abundance of information regarding deep sea studies, with less information available in Eastern Europe. However, this could be caused by restrictions in access to information with blocked websites like for Russia or Ukraine, and the, diffi the difficulty in searching for information due to language barriers, for example, with the Russian alphabet. And so there, there is also likely um, a trend with GDP or the proximity to deep sea, amongst other, that could really explain this increase and um, decrease in the number of institutions um, that are exploring deep sea um, within Europe. Now, um, along with limited access to information online and language barriers, other challenges for the research were um, the diversity of terms that we actually use to specific technologies and instruments. And so this, it's really not, there, there is a lack of consensus on, on, of consensus on how we call things and uh, tools and expertise. And so that's what, that might have been a limitation in our search as well. Or um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, again, the deep sea capacity of some countries was difficult um, here as well um, to define because the country was an overseas territory um, or a dependency of another country. So, for example, the Faroe Islands, islands are islands about halfway between Norway and Iceland, part of the Kingdom of Denmark. And such territories, in fact, are can benefit from the resources um, from the sovereign nation. Um, but it's difficult for us then to really differentiate between what is really independent within the territory or what is dependent on the um, sovereign nation. And so it was difficult to define if the capacity was really local or if it was what we called a foreign capacity. Overall, Europe countries are really big players in increasing deep sea exploration worldwide because of their high interest also in deep sea industries like mining. Therefore, they will have a lot to learn from this assessment in order to build the capacity for fair and informed decision making regarding the exploration and the protection of the deep sea. Well, I think, um, yeah, we went through the world. <laughs> 
<laughs> thank you, Mahood, for the world tour. Um, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, again, there will be even more information than we were able to share um, in the last hour in the full report, which we're so excited about getting out into the world um, in the next week or so. Our hope is that this assessment will provide the baseline information needed to strategically develop, responsibly implement, and quantitatively measure the impact of deep sea exploration and research capacity development over the course of the ocean decade and beyond. Um, Katie put uh, some links in the chat. You can sign up for updates for the full release at a uh, link in the chat. Of course, follow us on Twitter and reach out to the team via email if you have any questions. Um, unfortunately, we um, don't have time to take questions now, but you can write into the chat and we would be very happy to answer any um, following, following today's seminar. So thank you again. And I'd like to turn it over to, back over to Joanne and Katie. Thanks so much, Katie and Mode. This was uh, excellent, but as you said, we did run out of time. Uh, so if you did have a question, please reach out to um, either the Ahoy at an OceanDiscoveryLeague.org, or you can place that uh, some questions in the question chat. I will leave the GoTo uh, webinar open for another couple minutes if you wanted to ask those questions, and I will record them and send them on to our speakers today. Uh, but since we are over time, I'm just going to thank again everyone and thank our speakers especially uh, for presenting today we did record this we will post it up on the library's YouTube channel so uh, thank you for coming today I hope everyone has a safe healthy rest of their Wednesday thank you all thanks everyone